Yo, what's up YouTube? Welcome back to Intuition. In today's video, we're going to be covering the topic of pharmacotherapeutics. Now, this is a topic that I rarely cover on this channel. And the main reason why I don't cover a lot of pharmacotherapeutics is because of the way that it was taught to us in pharmacy school. The way that that subject was taught made it very boring and not appealing to someone like me. Because I think that real learning is not just about knowing the answers to questions, but it's mainly about being able to justify the answer to a question. Real learning is an understanding why a certain answer is correct. And that's basically what I preach on this channel and it's what this channel is all about. So what I want to do is I want to take a different approach to pharmacotherapeutics because pharmacotherapeutics is very important. It's basically what pharmacy is all about. The job of being a pharmacist is all about making sure that the right patient gets the right drug at the right time. So knowing pharmacotherapeutics is very important. And when this subject is taught from a concept and a logical perspective, it becomes very fun to learn. So that's the approach I'm going to take with these questions. So these are going to be concept questions that are going to help you get better at pharmacotherapeutic questions. All right. So with that said, let's dive into these questions. Okay. Question number one says, a patient is being treated with a standard therapy drug for a chronic illness. During today's appointment, the physician determines that the patient's illness is not being controlled by the current therapy. What general approach should be taken to optimize drug therapy for this patient? So this is going to be a classic type of question that you're going to get. A patient is going to be taking a certain drug for a certain disease, and in this case, the drug is not fully controlling the disease. So as a pharmacist, what do we do in this type of situation? You wanna make sure that the current treatment that the patient is on is optimized. So maybe the illness that we're talking about here is hypertension. Maybe the patient has high blood pressure. Now, depending on how severe the hypertension is, you will start off with a low dose or a high dose of a certain medication. You want to make sure that the dose of the drug is optimized. So that's the first thing you want to do. So maybe the current dose of the drug that the patient is taking is too low a dose for the patient's condition. So you would want to recommend increasing the dose of the medication if possible. You want to optimize medication dosage. And then after you optimize the dose of the drug, you have the patient come back sometime later and you give them a reassessment to see how well the dose optimization worked. And if the patient's disease is still not under control, then typically what you would do is you would add on an additional therapeutic. So that's the way that you want to think about how to control illnesses, right? You optimize the current treatment and then you add on an additional treatment. So with that said, the correct answer would be answer choice A. First, optimize the current drug dosage before considering add-on therapy, all right? So let's go on to question number two. Question number two says, what characteristics should add-on therapy possess in comparison to standard treatment. So when you're giving a patient a standard treatment and the standard treatment is not fully controlling the condition, then you want to implement add-on therapy. And the thing that you want to make sure about add-on therapy is you want to make sure that, that the add-on therapy that you give the patient has a different mechanism of action than the standard therapy. Why? Because you run the risk of overdosing the patient. Even though it's a different drug, the drug works the same way. So it's almost like you're giving the patient more of the same drug that they're already taking, which is not something that you want to do. You want to give them a different drug that attacks the illness from a different route. You want them to have different mechanism of actions that synchronizes together to better control the illness. You definitely want to make sure that you don't give a patient multiple drugs from the same drug class, okay? If they have the same mechanism of action, one of those drugs has to go. All right, let's go on to question number three. Okay, question number three says, standard treatments for HIV typically involve two NRTIs, i.e. nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors and a protease inhibitor drug. Why is it okay to use two drugs with a seemingly similar mechanism of action for this disease? When it comes to an illness like HIV, typically we implement two NRTI drugs. These are your metabolite inhibitor drugs. Now, this might seem like a contradiction to what we just said about making sure that you give patient drugs with different mechanisms of action because two NRTIs are two drugs from the same drug class, which means that they have basically the same mechanism of action. But in this case, it's okay for HIV. Now, why is that? Answer choice A says it's because HIV is incurable. That's not why. Answer choice B says, because the two NRTIs inhibit the action of two different metabolites. Perfect. B is exactly correct. In HIV, the two NRTIs are drugs that inhibit certain nucleotides or nucleosides 
that are responsible for the formation of DNA. You're inhibiting the DNA of the virus. DNA is made up of four nucleotides, right? your A, your T's, your G's, and your C's. And the thing is, when it comes to anti-metabolite drugs, you can inhibit any one of those metabolites. You just want to make sure that you inhibit the implementation of different metabolites. When you do this, these two drugs, even though they behave the same way, they're inhibiting two different metabolites. And as long as those two drugs are inhibiting the implementation of two different metabolites, then you can give those two drugs together. So it seems like a contradiction, but it's really not and answer choice B captures it perfectly, and that is the correct answer. All right, let's go on to the next question. Question number four says, when treating a reoccurring illness, it is standard practice to seek what drug regimens were taken in the past. How would this information be utilized to treat a patient's current illness when it is an infectious disease versus a non-infectious disease? This question is dealing with reoccurring illness, and basically that could be anything, right? There are all types of illnesses that can reoccur. With a reoccurring illness, what you want to ask is, you want to ask, did the drug regimen taken in the past alter the drug target? If the drug regimen taken in the past has caused the drug target to change, then you might want to give the patient a different drug regimen. Whereas, if the drug regimen taken in the past does not alter the drug target, then you can give the patient the same drug regimen as long as the drug regimen was shown to have worked in the past. When it comes to infectious disease, you gotta remember antibiotics alter the drug targets. And because of the risk of resistance, you don't want to give the patient the same drug that you gave them the last time. You want to give them a different drug, okay? Whereas if it's a different disease like obesity or hypertension, chances are the drug target is the same. You can give them the same drug regimen that the patient took in the past to get their blood pressure under control. So that's what you want to do with that type of information. So that's the concept behind this question here. And the correct answer would be answer choice B, re-implement a past regimen for a non-infectious disease and implement a different regimen for an infectious disease. Okay, answer choice B would be the correct answer. All right, let's go on to the last question, question number five. Okay, question number five says, a physician wants to treat a patient for pain, but she is concerned about drug abuse. She asks you, pharmacist, what opioid formulation could be implemented to minimize risk? What is a good recommendation to give the physician? So when it comes to drug abuse or abuse in general or addiction in general, addiction is primarily caused by instant gratification. When you are looking for a certain feeling and that feeling kicks in fast, you're more likely to get addicted to that substance. So when it comes to choosing a medication and you're worried about abuse, you want to choose a medication that has a slower onset of action. So you definitely want to stay away from anything that is inhaled and anything that goes directly through the veins. So an oral formulation would be ideal. Something that is consumed orally is going to be a little bit slower because it has to go through the intestines and it has to dissolve and be absorbed before the patient feels any sense of gratification from the drug. So that's the answer that we want to look out for here. And which answer choice gives us the correct answer? Once again, answer choice B gives us the correct answer which says implement a formulation with a slower onset of action. And that's definitely what you will want to look for when trying to control abuse. All right, so there you have it. I hope that you guys learned something from this video. I think that when pharmacotherapeutics is taught in this type of manner where, where we focus on the concepts and, and focus on understanding why answers are correct, I think it's better for everybody. So let me know if you guys learned something from the video. Leave it in the comment section below. Go ahead and give the video a like. And if you're new to this channel, go ahead and subscribe and join our family here. With that said, I'll leave you guys with this and I'll see you in the next one. All right, bye-bye.